Hi, and welcome to another episode of You're in Charge, Conversations That Spark Change. I'm your host, Glenn Pash. And in today's episode, we talk with leadership coach and author, Tony Martinetti, about his journey and how he had to pivot his whole life. And that became the inspiration of his book, Climbing the Right Mountain. And he challenges uh, me, and now he'll challenge you as well, to think about that. Are you really fulfilled? Are you working towards something that you really are meant to do? Or are you climbing that wrong mountain? And that's led him now to build his own leadership company, focusing and helping all of us to be more inspired leaders ourselves, but also through how we coach and develop our teams, we are inspiring them as well. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Can't wait to share it with you. So let's dive into today's episode of You're in Charge, Conversations that Spark Change with author and leadership coach, Tony Martinetti. All right, so Tony, thank you so much for being here. Really excited to unpack a lot of things. I was excited to really dive into who you are and what you do. Um, Love to talk about your book, and we'll get that in a moment because it was just released. But this concept of inspired leadership, that really struck a note with me. You see a lot of people talking about leadership, different monikers around leadership. But the fact of being inspired leadership, unpack that for me. What does that mean? Yeah, I'm so glad to be here, first of all, and just to say that I'm um, thank you for you know creating this space. And I would just say that, you know, the starting point of being inspired leadership is starting with having this ability to see yourself as being someone who's inspired yourself before you can lead others down this mm-hmm. path of being inspired. You have to start with what is it that we're all about? How are we creating something that's bigger than just one person? or a group of people coming together and, you know, banging out our jobs and doing things together. It Mm -hmm. has to be something bigger. What is the bigger purpose behind what we're doing? And that inspiration piece is that it's not something that just shows up once and then you're like, great, now we're done. It has to be built over time. It's an ongoing effort where we see ourselves as, you know, what is keeping the engine going? How we continue to build the muscle that's inspiring us on a daily basis on this quest to create what we want as a company, Mm -hmm. as um, an organization, as a group of people who want to change something in the world. So whatever that might be. So so uh, that's interesting because what what I got out of that just right out of the gate is there's an intentionality about it, meaning there is a, you you know, we are going to build something or we have a vision of where we want to go. So it sounds as if, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's we have an end goal, we, we need to sort of reverse engineer back to actions that are going to inspire. So it's a almost cyclical. If I'm inspired to be a part of this, the fact that we are getting results inspires me. So it becomes this, uh, you know, circle engine. Am I, am I, am I on the right path with that? Yeah, there's, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you just, just you just hit the, the nail on the head in the sense that you don't just show up one day and say, I'm inspired to do this activity. But what happens is you get people to follow along because they're excited about the vision that you created, or you've collectively created a vision that ex- excites them, gets them thinking that this is a worthy cause. It's something that we're excited about doing. Like I came from the world of biotech where, you know, the big purpose, especially for the leaders that I worked on, uh, worked with originally, there was this element of putting the patient at the center of everything. Right. Um, And when you do that, there's this element of like, there's somebody's life on the line. And when we do that, this element of you can't wait You have to continue to push on and see Mm -hmm. how can we help that person? That person's face shows up on your doorstep every day and you say, yeah, I can't wait to go to the office and see what I can do every day to help that person, that child live a better life. And um, then as you get results and you see, wow, this is working. Mm -hmm. You know, now if we do this more thing, we innovate here, we create this 
and we're starting to move this engine forward. And then you have a setback and you see a setback as, what can we do with this? Mm -hmm. What do we create with this setback? Right. And a leader who doesn't connect with truly what inspires them will fail. They'll just say, oh, I, it is what it is. I mean, maybe this is not the right path for us. So, Instead, so without that inspiration, you're not willing yeah. to fight through the tough times. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Okay. Let me, let me ask something about that. Because again, when you're talking about a, a, in biotech, or you're talking about a, an individual you know, in, in this case, your example was someone who is a, a, a patient, someone sick. It is that experience. Mm. Does it apply to companies that are building products? Because should they be looking past the product to the experience that the customer is going to have interacting with this product? I think sometimes we stop at the product. Um, wh wh what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I love that you brought this in because I, um, I've always thought about experience as being such an important part of the overall thing that we're creating as leaders. It's not just about, oh, great, look what I've created, this amazing you know, iPhone or what, not to pick on Apple, but it's so much more than that. Right. Um, you've created something that allows people to communicate, to, to do something. And what is it that there's the jobs to be done? Mm -hmm. um, it's the experience overall, like how do you create a community with your product? Um, so I think that is exactly what we need to tap into is that what is the bigger picture that you're trying to create with your company? Because if you're just trying to create a better product, I think you're missing something. Right. I, I, I agree with you. So, so then let's break this down. So if someone, you know, the point of this podcast has always been to help the people who, as you were saying, we're in that leadership position or we want to be in the leadership or we're overseeing a product or project. And here, here they are and they're sitting there going, okay, Tony, this all sounds good, right? I want to be inspired. I'm inspired, but how do I get my team? So walk me through maybe one or two things that someone could do. Because when you say inspiring someone, it takes actions or communication, as you said. So walk yeah. me through something that an individual listening to this could take away to say, let me go try this with my team to see if I can ignite a little bit of that inspiration. Yeah. So the first step is to be truly honest with themselves, um, to step away from the day-to-day -day grind of what they're doing and say to themselves, am I truly doing this? For the right reasons what's my reason for doing the what the work i'm doing you may mm -hmm. think you're inspired but make sure you're connected to the reason why you're doing this is connected to a story that is deeper than just making money or making a better widget or you know whatever it may be and make sure you have that in a way that it connects to your deeper sense of who you are because when it does what happens is without you even saying a word, you're speaking volumes. People will get to feel you and understand that you do truly understand and value the work that you're doing. Um, if you're trying to fake it, mm -hmm. people see right through that. Right, but um, if you're, so, so so again, I can I can hear people in their head going, this, this sounds a little touchy-feely, right? Yes. Right. It's a little touchy feely. But if someone was saying, listen, I'm doing this because I'm I, I want to provide for my family. Right. Yeah. So I'm working hard. I want to do a good job for my, you know, for my business. But for instance, if I'm a salesperson or is what, what I'm hearing you say is go beyond. I'm, I sold 10. But if you understand what the impact for those consumers by having this widget, whatever it is, will will bring more uh, maybe excitement, more passion, yeah. more inspiration to you because it if it's just the number versus what this sale does on the other side to help someone, right? Then then we get just stuck in the numbers and and it, it, we can end up losing touch with why we're even here and then there's the frustrations and as we said, not willingness to learn more, to push through, to be more successful. Exactly. It's you reminded me of a quote that um, I don't know where this came from originally, but it's this element of like, if you focus on money, you'll make money. Mm -hmm. If you focus on impact, you'll have an impact. 
Right. So you have to decide what you want as a leader. You know, when you go with the right intention of what it is that you want to create, whether you're a sales leader or you're a leader at the, you know, the CEO, CFO, mm -hmm. what you have to do is you get to be very intentional and transparent about what you want to create because the people around you are watching and listening and they're going to pick up on those things, whether you're saying them or embodying them. Right. And I know that again, this is all very touchy feely, but the reality is this is happening. But it's not, like it it's not. not really. I did, but see, this is the thing now, the way that you're explaining it, it's not necessarily touchy feely, right? So if you're yeah. saying I'm a leader, I'm creating an environment for my team. Yeah. Right. So that when someone comes into my environment on my team, we are we have a purpose that we're going to work where we have training or tasks or skills that we're constantly mm -hmm. may improving to deliver that. But at the same moment in time, we are creating an environment to support each other, help each other to achieve this greater goal. So so what you're saying is, is that it's not touchy feely. It, inspiration is the byproduct of action. That's mm -hmm. what it sounds like. So it sounds like what you're saying is, is be thoughtful of how you're setting up and what you're doing with your team and creating that environment so that people can thrive and, and feel like they are doing something bigger than the just checking the box. I did my job time to go home. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny you say that about inspiration is a byproduct of action. It's right and wrong. Because you have, it's, it's actually the, it's like the chicken and egg mm -hmm. You need inspiration to move into the right actions. But you also, once you take those actions, it inspires you to do more. Right. So it is a byproduct, but it's also a precursor mm -hmm. for you be able to step into the right actions. Right. Um, yeah, I think so. That's right. That makes sense because, you know, I could be inspired, but if I don't know what to do, yeah. then that, then I lose my inspiration on, on the flip side. If I'm, if I have the right actions and I step into it, but, but I think that, I think it, yeah, I think that inspiration is that willingness to go into something that maybe I'm not comfortable with yet, or I, I have an idea in my head and I have to do it. And then once I step into this, all of a sudden it, it, I'm getting that feedback. And I think that's one of the things I want to dive in a little deeper into, because you touched on it, but I don't want people to skim by it was that idea of taking a moment to be self-aware of, how you process the feedback as you're moving through all of this to hopefully, right, put you, if you're on the wrong path or the wrong actions and you're not feeling, how do I get back on, uh, on track to keep that willingness to come show up again tomorrow and give it mm -hmm. another shot? Yes, absolutely. I love that you say this because there's some, something about that that is um, a journey that we're all on. You know, there's you know, you don't always have this element of like immediate feedback that says, great, you know, I did this action and I got results and, right. you know, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> right. It doesn't work that way. Life does not work that way. Uh, you sometimes have to commit to a longer game and continuing to do the actions um, and expect that that's planting a seed for a period of time that eventually will bear fruit. So then how is a leader, right? Because, And I agree with you on that. There are some things that are very transactional in the moment. You know if it works or it doesn't work, or you get, you, maybe it doesn't work or it doesn't work on the grander scale, but you're getting feedback where other times you may not see it, but as you said, planting the seed. So how does, what would you advise a leader who sat in front of you and said, okay, yes, our process is longer term, meaning we're not going to see the results for 60, 90 days, six months, maybe a year, real results that we can make a judgment on. How do you keep, keep that team moving forward when maybe the actions or the job is, I don't want to say monotonous, it's a wrong word, but it could be a little bit of Groundhog's Day, let's say, where it's mm. it's very similar every day. So so what, what's the recommendations for inspiration? How do I, as a leader, stay inspired to, to cheer these people on? Or are they just looking at me and saying, well, if Glenn's doing his job with, you know, he's doing it all out. Well, then we'll do our job all out. How, how, how do you help them uh, keep, keep their team on track? I'm going to throw a few, um, a, a math formula for you. So sure. I love, I love <laughs> math. So let's go. 
So I'm a former finance person. So I, you know, I used to spend my life in numbers and equations. And um, the, the formula is that you have to take some risk, mm -hmm. some measured risk, plus some courage and some intuition. And intuition, let me define all those terms a little bit. Intuition comes from experience. It mm -hmm. comes from this ability to have had some results in the past and things that you've tried before in your prior lives as a, a, you know, in your journey to becoming the leader that you are, knowing that sometimes these things work out, sometimes they don't. Um, and now you're at this place where you're put in the place to make a decision. Courage, the courage to really say, I'm willing to go forth into the unknown. I'm willing to take this chance and know that if it doesn't work out, you know, what can I do with that? Mm -hmm. Um, and then measured risk is to know that you're not going to put the entire company at risk of failure by taking this course of action. So all those things, those things come together to, to allow you to take that next step um, into, the, into what the next path would be, because you're not going to know the results of those things that you're going to do right. by doing those things and allowing your team to see that you're doing this without knowing the answers mm -hmm. and you're sharing that with them transparently, it, it helps them to come along with confidence. So my, my brain, as you were talking, just went right to the next sort of topic and pivot then. So my point is then, or my question is, where do you see the obstacles, right? So we're, right, we got our math formula mm -hmm. and this all makes sense on paper. But a company brings you in to say, hey, I need some help, Tony. Yeah. Where are the obstacles or where are the struggles? Is there a commonality that you've seen in all of your work with different organizations um, that, you know, when you walk in and you do maybe your audit to say, okay, what's going on? Are there, are there maybe a few common obstacles that all struggling organizations have? Yeah. One of the biggest obstacles is this, this desire to stay to their path that they've been on mm -hmm. and not wanting to change. People say that they're willing to change or they're willing to tr try new innovative approaches, but oftentimes we're so afraid of stepping out into a bold unknown. Right. Um, and I think that is the irony of it all. A lot of that talk of change is, um, it sounds good on paper, but actually right. committing to that is the hardest part for anybody. Well, do you find when you sit in those conversations with, with you know, let's say the leadership table, because I've been in the same situation, mm -hmm. you know, if I've been brought in, that's the first question I ask is, do you really want to change? You know, because this, you know, it, it is going to be, there are going to be some struggles. Do you find it's a divided table, meaning that maybe one person definitely wants to go in on the change? They understand why and they understand the struggles and maybe other people go, I don't want to really deal with the pushback from our team or I don't want to have to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is it more divided or is it usually unified in the, yeah, we want to change, but no, we really don't want to. Um, there's a lot of division. I mean, there's in it, and I wouldn't paint every situation as the same, but right. there are a lot of companies that are, you know, there's not everyone's on the same page um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of the functions that are operating from this place of like, I, I know what's right for my function. I know what is right, right from my point of view, but I haven't quite embrace the view of what the what's right for the overall company to move the company forward um, and i often think about the um the old adage of like the big arrow and the little arrows and trying to get everyone working in the same direction and that's really what a lot of the work that i do is about is helping people to get alignment around what is it that we're really after and how does me getting aligned with the big arrow really help to drive the mission forward um, and that might really be a kink into my own ego to say that I was wrong or that I, my position is not the right path. Um, and when you do get people to own up to that and see that the change is good, um, it's really a powerful way to move forward. Do you find 
as an advisor going in that sometimes the need or the desire for change is is based on the fact that they may not be doing what they're supposed to be doing 100%, meaning that they think they have to change more than they have to. Uh, but if they actually were doing what they told you they were supposed, you know, if you said, well, what, what, what should your team be doing? And you say, well, they should be doing these 10 things. And you go look and you're going, they're doing six of them. But if we got them to do all 10 of them, maybe you only have to change one or two things. Do you find that that is also a contributing factor that somewhere along the line accountability has been causing this this yeah. angst in terms of change you said the a word uh accountability uh it's it's important that we hold people accountable to saying you know hey this is what we agreed to this is what we need to do and if you are willing to to take those steps this is what's going to create this movement forward now you can't expect people to have perfect actions, perfect um, path forward. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be things that are in the way. Sure. But we also have to have good communication that allows us to say, this is why I'm not making progress on this. This is why I'm having challenges and address those issues as they go forward. So there's an element of like balancing that accountability and we'll call it action because you have to, you know, knowledge without action is meaningless. Yes. Um, you can present a plan that says, this is what we need to do to move forward. But if no one takes any action, it's like, okay, well, that's not going to help. Right. Um, but if you put a plan in place, hold people accountable, but then have compassion along the way to say like, yeah, I mean, okay, these things cannot be perfect. Let's learn, move forward, adjust, and then continue to go on this path. Right. I love I Well, I love what you just said there, because I, I'm a firm believer of that as well, in terms of change is hard. We have to be as a leader empathetic to the learning curve, right? There, there, a lot of it is how you train in the beginning or how you communicate what the change is going to be, your yeah. willingness to invest in them in the beginning to help them along the way. And there are going to be people who want to go back to their old habits and you have to be willing. I mean, there has there are eventually will be a point where you say it's time to come on board. But yeah. to your point is, and I think it's real for all of you listening who are leading teams, what Tony just said is truly important is having the being the guide, but being that coach, having the empathy to help people through this. Um, so let's pivot a little bit. How, you know, I was looking at your sort of your history and where you came from. I'd love to know a little bit about how, why you ended up where you are now. Where did this passion for helping leaders, you know, we'll get to the book in a moment, but the fact that here you are coaching and developing and helping people do this, has this always been in your DNA? You know, if we roll back to ninth grade, Tony, that you've always been someone who has been sort of a coach and developing no matter where you were. Hmm. It's an interesting question. I love this question because um, my journey to getting to where I am has been quite interesting. Um, I was an artist as a child and my artistry was more around creating, um, looking at the experience that people have. I would paint rooms and emotional experiences of rooms. People would walk into rooms and have different ways of showing up and, and experiencing them. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I thought I would do forever. In fact, I was going to be an architect. That was my plan. And eventually I ended up becoming a pre-med major and then switching into business eventually. And then along the way, I realized this had this ability to see people, but I continued to buckle down and be a finance person right. dealing with numbers. It was almost like I was forcing myself into this world of numbers. Um, but the reality is that along this way, I, I came to see that there were leaders. I was a student of leadership all along. I was always watching what leaders did, how they showed up, how they connected with people. And um, it all kind of came to a head when I had this moment in a boardroom where I had, you know, I'd been on this journey of understanding coaching and, you know, seeing burnout and all these things happen to me. And this moment was just seeing two leaders argue about something meaningless. And right. 
it was about them protecting their own image um, around, you know, 40 people sitting in this room and just realizing that, my gosh, this is not leadership. This is, this is toxic in, right. in reality. And I had this feeling in me that said, I can't do this any longer. I can't connect. I can't collect a paycheck any longer and allow this to be my life. Right. Of just, you know, sitting in boardrooms and allowing people to just do this. Um, I need to do something different. And so I walked out. Hmm. I walked out and I said, I'm going to change the room. I'm going to leave the room to change the room. And that's what I did. Oh, I love that. Leave, leave, the, leave the room to change the room. Yeah. And, I'm, and it's not to say that that's the path for everybody, because honest to God, it's, it's really can be uh, quite a daunting uh, sure. path to go on. Entrepreneurial path is not for everybody, but um, it was for me. It's what I had to do. I had to go out and endeavor in this, into this journey. And, um, and that's what led me into, into what I'm doing. And honestly, I'm so grateful um, because it's created this, um, this journey for me to dig deeper into who I am and to see how the inner journey can unlock so much for people as a, you know, not just leaders, but I think, you know, anyone who wants to go on that journey of seeing who they deeply are, it starts with having deep conversations with yourself and seeing what do I stand for? Right. Who am I really? Well, what I liked about that, and I think again, you know, in these conversations that I have with, with my guests and especially right here is a lot of times the most successful and, and again, not monetarily, but grounded yeah. successful people who are, a, they feel very rooted in what they're doing at the moment are those that take their whole journey, everything they've done as valuable yeah. versus discounting something because maybe it wasn't successful or I didn't like doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with someone yesterday and we were talking about him, his journey. And he said, if I only knew this now, you know, back then, what could I have done? And I said, but here's the thing. If you knew what you know now back then, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be the person you are today. We'd like to always look back 2020 and hindsight and said, if only I invested in this, boy, would I be better? Mm. And I'd say, but you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have yeah. the family that you have, your friends that you have. Who knows? You, you're painting the picture as it's all going to be beautiful. Mm. But I had said to another friend one time who made the comment, if I only invested, I would be rich. And I said, yeah, but how do you know you would have been a good person? How do you know you wouldn't have overdosed? How do you know you'd still be alive? I mean, there's so many variables versus mm. saying, Everything I am has brought me to today. And I, and I love what you keep, you've, re, you've said it multiple times is where are we going with this? What are, what impact are we going to have today and tomorrow based on everything we have? So give me one or two things in your journey that really stood out as an impactful moment for you that said, I look back, even if it was something that you said, man, I fell flat on my face but I'm so grateful I did because I think a lot of people look at you, you touched on it before the, the setbacks, we, we negate setbacks as sometimes negative versus look what you learned. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny. I'll just say, like you say, like 2020 vision, you know, I think 2020 has taken on a new, new meaning now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll skip to that. Okay. <laughs> Very well put. Um, <laughs> well, I would say the first thing that I would um, connect with is the first time that I was laid off from a job, I think is always, it's always a moment that people have. And they say like, oh my gosh, when you attach all of your meaning to a job, it, it feels like being punched in the gut. Mm. But what I've really come to see, and it's something that I see in a lot of people is that we have to stop connecting all of our, per, all of our worth into one thing. Um, that's what I did for a lot of my career. I started to connect with this feeling of like putting all my eggs in the one basket mm -hmm. and defining myself as I am the finance guy. And 
<laughs> now I know that's far from the truth. Um, and when you liberate yourself from that, it is just the most amazing feeling in knowing that you can create just about anything if you're committed, if you're committed to the work and not just the work, but if you're committed to feeling all the feelings that go along with the journey of going into the unknown. Right. See, I love that because so there's two parts and people who have who are listeners to the to this podcast have heard me mention this a few times is one of my volunteer sort of side gigs uh, is helping people in job transition. And I would speak to them. Uh, and a lot of them were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they had been in an organization for eight, 10 years, and they were laid off or whatever. And now they're going, what do I do? And I communicate because I was the exact same way. I'd worked for an organization for about 12, 13 years and was told, oh, you'll never be you're valuable. And when things got bad, I was one of the first people to go. But I had mm. so wrapped my whole being into that job. I had no not, you know, no one knew me. No, I didn't know what I didn't even know what I was good at. Mm. And it took a long time to unpack that where I vowed I will never be tied. The job is part of me. It's what I do, but it's not me. Yeah. And I really agree with that. And I think that's such a great lesson for everyone listening is that your job is not you. Mm. And, you know, if, if you strip away all the titles at every company you had, there's a common thread of you through all of that. Forget the title. Who are yeah. you? What have you done? And I love that. What you're saying is, is that you it's everything about it. And, and it frees you up versus, as you said, I'm the finance manager, that's limiting versus look at all that I bring to the people that I'm surrounded with at this moment on my journey. Yeah. What is uniquely you about that? You know, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, it's something that is really powerful. Um, and I think most people don't see themselves. They just see the things that they do, the doing and not the being. Well, it's the title. A lot of times yeah. it's, you know, it's an easy way for everyone to turn around and say uh, how they can communicate with each other of who they are. Right. And, and, and it's one of those things, as you said, but if you go to a cocktail party or whatever, or you meet some people like the, one of the first default questions is what do you do? Yeah. Because it's easy for everybody to frame, Oh, you're a finance person frame. You're this frame mm -hmm. versus really just, that's what I do but that's not who I am. And I yes. think that's a big difference, which is going circling all the way back to the beginning of this. That's where that inspirational leadership comes from. Mm -hmm. It's not the title, the, the most uninspiring leaders lead with their title. Yeah. And they wield their title like a hammer to beat you into submission to do the work versus the title is just, it's, I always say the title just means I have different duties than you do to make the machine move forward. That's all it is. It's not, it's not a hammer. So I think all of this conversation circling back to inspired and understanding yourself and who you are and freeing yourself to be more present. I think it's really something and I'm so glad we're talking about it because I think it's so necessary and I feel it in, in people and organizations and maybe because it was, as you joke, 2020 was so devastating to a lot of people that people now are looking and going, they're questioning a lot of different yeah. things now. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing for them to question. <laughs> we should continue to question. And it's funny, you had asked me, like, what are some other, you know, I, I want to add another moment. Sure. That, um, a learning moment. Uh, and um, I'll choose one that is actually more recent. Um, it was pre 2020, but it, it was something that I really learned along my journey of becoming, um, you know, starting my business. And it was when I first started coaching being the imposter, of course, that I, <laughs> I was like, Oh, who am I to do this? Right. Um, you first start thinking about, you know, competition and thinking about, you know, how do I create my niche and all this stuff? And one of the things I learned early days is this, is that, and it's, I'll wrap it up in a quote, which I love quotes, as you can see, mm -hmm. um, is that, you know, amateurs compete and professionals create. Mm -hmm. Instead of going out there and feeling like, oh, I can't share what I'm doing with the people like other coaches or other 
consultants or other professionals, I decided to really embrace this uh, idea of learning from the people who have been on the journey already. Sure. Um, and figuring out how can I learn from them? How can I be a learner again, a beginner again? Because I am a beginner at that point, even though I had a long career. And being open um, to, to being vulnerable to other people. And what it did is it really created this element of like people seeing me as, you know, someone to collaborate with, mm -hmm. to create something bigger together, creating communities, being in community. And it, um, it really opened up this space of abundance uh, versus uh, scarcity, feeling like, oh, I have to be the lone soul right. that um, has to win the day. Well, it, it's, it's, that, it's that idea of zero sum. Right. Yeah. So if I win, you lose. If you win, I lose versus, you know, people have always asked me, you know, for my my marketing agency, when we we would hold events, I would good friends of mine who ran agencies. I said, well, why don't you come participate? And people always were dumbfounded. They're saying, why are you bringing another agency? You know, they're going to steal the work. And I said, there's enough for everybody. Would you stop with this? And I think to your point for all, everyone who's listening, if you're in a leadership position or you're starting a new project or you're, you know, going out on your own and you're taking that leap of faith, I hate to say it, but most people, they're not focused on you. They're not worried about yes. you, right? We love to think that everybody is thinking about us versus no. So go out and ask with yeah. humility and confidence. It's not, oh, please. If you're saying, hey, listen, Tony, I, I really respect what you're doing. Could, could you do this? That's what I did when I started the podcast. A very dear friend of mine, he has a very successful podcast. And I said, all right, can you help me? And he said, are you willing to do it now? Because I'd been talking about it for a year. And he said, I'm not talking anymore. When you're ready to do it, call me. And I said, okay, I'm ready. And he was more than generous. Now, someone would say, well, why would he do that? Because there's enough for everybody. And I really love mm -hmm. that, that abundance mentality. I think it's really important for everyone to really embrace. Um, so I want to, I would, I don't, we, we're just chatting away and time always <laughs> runs quickly on these things, but I would be remiss. I, your, your, your book, climbing the right mountain. Um, when we connected, I was like, let me go look at this. And I see that it's a new release, right? Mm -hmm. Fair, fairly new, but I started reading it. And I, so again, I love the fact that you do have quotes all in there, which I love. Um, but one of the quotes I thought was really great, you know, what happens, you know, we all want, I'm paraphrasing it, you know, climbing to the top of the ladder. That's what we want to do. But what if it's leaning against the wrong mountain? And I thought that was really cool. So tell me about, I have specific things to ask you, but first talk to me about the genesis of where this book came from and, and what was it like to really commit to writing this? Yeah, well, it's a great question. So first and foremost, um, you know, the genesis of the book came from this, you know, hearing people's stories, you know, coaching people along the way and, and realizing that, my gosh, like this really felt like I was talking to myself um, as I was hearing from people and, you know, realizing that I was on this path to getting to this place of, you know, I'm at the top of my mountain, theoretically, and feeling like I don't like the view. And I spent all this time and effort <laughs> right. uh, burning myself out, you know, um, sacrificing um, time with family, friends, and all the people in my life, and even my health, for that matter, um, to create something that I don't think I defined for myself. I think it was defined by society, people around me, that this is what you should want in life. Um, and so then I said to myself, oh gosh, this story is what people would really value is to mm -hmm. hear that you can do it differently. You can create a path at any point in your life. You're never too old. You're never too young. <laughs> right. Um, it's like the really Harry think. Potter steps. You can move yeah. the, the stairs a different way mm. uh, and goes back to intentionally you know, if you stop for a moment and say, like you did, I may not be to the top of the mountain, or maybe you work as you're saying, but I'm getting up pretty high here. And I don't like this view. So either I build it to a different mountain or come down off this ladder and go throw my ladder up against another mountain and start that climb. 
Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's, and what you really need to do is start thinking about like, who do you want to be along that journey? Not right. what do I want to have the titles and things like that. And it's not to say, Oh, don't strive to be CEO. Don't strive for this. Gosh, shoot for the moon for mm-hmm. sure. But ultimately do it for the right reasons, do it for the reasons right. that fulfill you personally and do it for who you want to be um, at the end of the day, because ultimately that's what matters. Um, what's going to matter is the impact that you want to have on others. No, and I think that's great. A gentleman I just interviewed, and it's going to be an episode. Uh, he is a, a dear friend of mine, but his name is Dan Moore, and he just did a TED talk, and it was talking about is your why a lie? Right. Same thing. Are, are we really aligned? And hit one of his last things, and and then I want to get to the couple things I have about your book. But he always said, you get one ticket on this ride, and when you're done, do you have regrets or are you fulfilled? So mm-hmm. to your point is sometimes we are focused on doing things maybe for the wrong reasons. We think they're the right, but in our heart, we're going, they're really wrong. And we're, we've talked ourselves into it. And all of a sudden time's done or the ride's over and you go, oh, if I only, if I could have. And, and that's why I love the title of the book. So, so I want to jump into this because as I was reading it and it, it, I'm, I'm just, you're probably about 15, 20 pages in, and it's, a, and it's a great book. It's a compact read, folks. So I'm recommending this book highly. I'll make sure it's in the show notes here. Um, but you talked about this idea of your excitement for traveling. Yes. But how you've moved that towards all experiences in your life. So let me just ask you a couple of things. So I got to put on my, for those of you listening, I got to put on my glasses because I'm half, half blind. But you say embrace novelty, right? That's number one, no matter what it is, embrace novelty. Number two is be curious. Number three is check in with yourself along the way, right? We're, that was what we were talking about before getting feedback on what's going on. Don't plan every detail. I love that. I want to hear more about that. And then keep a travel journal about the experience. So that makes complete sense when I'm going on vacation, as you're saying, don't plan everything and keep a travel journal. Give me the, I love it. Talk to me about how that parallel one uh, applies to all of your experiences, you know, and then secondly, what, you know, this idea of travel, I guess it means we're traveling on this. So, so it makes sense too. So, so talk to me a little about that, those different steps. Cause I found it really, as soon as I read it, it just, it just was like a, a bell that went off on my head and I was like, boom, I got to ask Tony about this. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, obviously it comes right through this, this idea that I love travel. It's not just about sitting on a beach it's about having adventures that really, you know, fill your soul with, you know, an understanding of the world and those tips that I that I'm offering and you know how they translate into your into your life and how to create a better path for you. It's novelty is what our brains crave, especially during periods of finding ourselves in the malaise of oh, the patterns I'm stuck in. So the novelty is what will really kind of get us unstuck mm. um, and trying new things will help to see, well, maybe this thing that I'm seeing will, you know, get me unstuck and think, you know, I never, I never thought about trying to, you know, blow glass or play the guitar or just going on a hike someplace. I never have been hiking, you know, that might be something that will lighten me up and create something new in me. Right. Or, you know, and then the writing in the journal is something that is so powerful because what happens is it helps, helps you to think about this is what's happening in my life at this point. But as we said before, you know, you're on a journey that, you know, the student has not necessarily met the right teacher yet. And um, when you do, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, when you reflect back on yourself and you say like, that's where I was now I'm here. Right. And now I can right. follow the breadcrumbs that have been laid out in my journal. Um, by exercising that, your um, that, that element of writing on your, your journey, you'll start to see the things that have been the patterns, the trends, the th- threads that are being laid out for you. 
So is that because I love the 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 curiosity, but mm -hmm. that idea of planning details. Uh, what struck me about that is um, I've been guilty of it. I know I know people who I've run across who ask me for advice, or I've counseled or coached or whatever, however you want to say it. Um, the planning of all the details, it, it, it create, potentially can create a hesitation of taking that first step because yes. it's not all perfectly mapped out versus what you're saying is trusting, giving yourself enough details to have a sense of direction, but allow mm -hmm. your curiosity. And I think that's why I love this is that the curiosity will push you through to say, that's going to keep you going because you know what's around the corner give yourself, check in with feedback and go, am I in the right direction, whatever, but that don't let the planning stop you from moving forward. But that, that's something I thought was very powerful. Yeah, you're absolutely right on the money. I mean, it's like you, you want to make sure that you have some directional sense, but leaving some space for serendipity to show up and, and allow yourself to, you know, see what this avenue might create for you but then, you know, looking for those elements of like, what is this all telling me? Mm -hmm. What direction is this all creating for me? Um, there's a magic in all of this that as you continue to let it unfold um, and checking in to saying like, you know, what is this revealing? Right. So. I really like that. And I think, you know, as I said, I, I'm just a few pages in, but it's just, it's, it's hooked me. Um, because of that, it seems very, your, your writing style is very accessible. It's not talking down at you or preaching to say, hey, you're on the wrong mountain, go over here. But what I love, it's that balance of, and I think those five steps really encapsulate the book and, and, and part of our conversation today, it seems that we, we always must remind ourselves that new is not bad. It's understanding and taking the time to be curious to ask so that we can make a decision to say, that's not really something I want to embark on today or ever. That's okay too. Or mm -hmm. I'm not at that moment, you know, versus as soon as I hear it, it's no, right. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going like that's no. Um, but it's this idea of you're in control of it. You're in control of the curiosity. You're in control of the, the uh, journey. You're in control of getting the feedback. And, and the planning or not planning, and then, then the documentation of this all. I really love that because, it, again, it goes back to the inspiration because I think in that framework, you can find inspiration to find the right path. You can also find the right teacher. You could be the right teacher for someone because it's that sense of movement forward versus getting so bogged down in the minutiae today or you know, limiting yourself from trying something new, because as you said, back when we were talking about the leaders who don't want to move forward, I, I'm really comfortable in what, what, what's, what has always been, but the world could have moved by and you're still stuck in the way you did it before or, or your fear of moving forward. So I really, and, and I think that goes back to your point, then you could end up at the top of a ladder on the wrong mountain because you're so adamant about this is the way I have to do it, or I've convinced myself to do it because you've lost the novelty or creativity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I just love that you, what you've taken out so far the book. And um, I can't wait to see uh, what you come back with after you read it, because yeah. um, your insights are spot on. It's beautiful. No, this is going to be one that I'm going to get some copies and send to people and say, just just read this one. So, uh, so listen, I, I, first off, I want to thank you for taking time to chat with me. I, 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 this has been a really fun conversation. I think it's pivoted into a, a lot of different directions, but I think this last conversation about the book has really sort of connected everything to it. Um, so first off, thank you so much. So, but at the end of every episode, we, we do five or six questions. I call them the one, meaning one word, one thought that comes in when you ask they have nothing to do with anything but they're sort of get to know tony behind the mic so first Great. question that we always ask people is food because people love food what's the one food that is your go-to i love to i cannot do without oh my gosh um <laughs> i would say that it has to be um 
chocolate chocolate chip cookies are just like my um, that's my my guilty pleasure. That that's the guilty. But I used to say guilty pleasure, and people were going, <laughs> "Well, I don't want to be guilty." I'm just saying, okay, what's the one you can do without? All right, number two, a place that you would like to travel that you have not been to yet. Turkey. It's been mm. on my list for a long time. And unfortunately, a lot of things have held me back, um, but I'm a fan of architecture. And it's one of the things that I want to see um, before I die. There you go. Um, what is something that you are reading or listening to that is inspiring you right now that you would recommend to other people? Uh, I went back and listened to an old book that um, I love. It's called Illuminate by Nancy Duarte. Oh, Nancy Duarte. Yes, stories. yes, 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 yes. Exactly. I know. I okay, it. great. Cool. We'll put that into the list too. Um, what's one trick that you do to get yourself back on track when you feel you've drifted off? It's called expand your vision, narrow. I look at what's possible okay. and then I focus in and narrow down. Okay, great. Love that. Um, Okay, just a couple more. If I got all of your friends, family, close people who really know Tony, put him in a room and said, describe Tony in one word, what would it be? Oh my gosh. It would be probably two words and uh, uh, it's courageous pioneer. Oh, I love and, that. Yeah. That's great. And it's, there's something about it because I take a lot of leaps into the unknown and mm -hmm. uh, very courageous uh, in the work that I do. Um, I wouldn't personally call myself that, but it's something that other people have said, that's who you are. Um, okay. I'm more humble. And uh, listen, and it's okay. That's why we're asking them and we're not asking you what you think of yourself. Uh, last question before we wrap up. Um, we've talked about a lot of different things and it's a lot of fun. But if there was one thing, just one thing that you would want listeners to take away with, one lesson, what would that mm -hmm. lesson be? Yeah, that one lesson would be um, have more honest conversations with yourself so that you can dig deeper into what you really want. Right. Great. Love that. Yeah. Love that. So again, Tony, thank you so much. So please. So uh, I'm sure we can get the book on Amazon, right? But uh, what I want to know is where can people uh, connect with you? So, you know, social media, website talk to me. So this way we can link all that up and they can reach out to you uh, if they so choose. Fantastic. And first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. This has been so enjoyable. The best place to find me is um, on my website, which is inspiredpurposecoach.com. And you can find all, find all, all types of great stuff there. My podcast is a great place to find out more about me, the virtual campfire. And my book, you can purchase on Amazon, which is called um, the, sorry, uh, Climbing the Right Mountain. I was going, I know the title. I, I know the title of your book. <laughs> and, and I guess the last place would be LinkedIn. I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. Great. And we'll, we'll put all those in the show notes as well. So again, if, you, if you're interested in reaching out to Tony, please do. Um, as you get a sense of who he is during this conversation, I think it's someone that you definitely should connect with. Uh, so again, Tony, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. So everyone, again, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, or if you're an Android user, go over there to Spotify as well. You can jump over to the YouTube channel and see the conversation between the two of us. Um, Please make sure you head over to uh, glenpash.com as well. You can download some free materials. Please make sure you share the episode. I'm sure there's a lot of people that could benefit from what Tony just said. Rate the podcast. That helps us spread the word as well. I know there's a lot of places that you can consume content, but the fact that you spent some time with Tony and myself today means the world. And as I say, at the end of every show, you're in charge. But now Tony gave you a few more tools to help you become more successful, both professionally and personally. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks again, Tony. Thanks. You Thank appreciate you. it so much. All right. Take care.